It is live. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay, well, we'll carry on then. Thanks a lot. And uh, again, welcome to everyone who is uh, tuning in to um, listen to this debate or not really debate, but a discussion among the candidates on a series of questions about climate and environmental issues. Just say a, a brief word about how we're gonna proceed. We'll begin with a one minute opening statement by each candidate, and then we'll move on to uh, four questions that I will pose to the candidate. Each candidate will have two minutes to address the question. And once each candidate has addressed the question, they will each have a one minute rebuttal. And then we'll move on to the next question. And I will uh, state the questions as we go along so that uh, everyone listening in will uh, understand uh, what we're aiming at. So uh, without further ado, I think we'll move on to the uh, opening statements by the candidates. And the first person to give their one minute opening statement will be uh, Ms. Boot, the NDP candidate. Thank you, Michael. Uh, hello, my name is Tony Boot, and I am pleased to be running uh, in this Penticton riding for the BC NDP. Thank you, Jim, for acknowledging that we are on silk territory, and thank you to the First Things First Okanagan for the important advocacy work that you do. Uh, the, pan the pandemic has made um, has made living difficult for so many of us, but it has also shown us that change is possible. There's nothing more important than taking care of this place that we call home, water, the land, the air. And it, it makes BC especially such a great place to raise our kids to live and work and play, I suppose. I spent much of my life working for sustainability and I'm proud to be running for a party that has the most ambitious climate action strategy on the continent, a clean BC program that was written with the BC Greens. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Okay, we'll um, move on then to the next candidate in my list here. The lists are all in uh, random order, so they'll be different for each round. Uh, so Mr. Schumacher, the Green Party, will you give your one minute statement, please? Hi, in the, in the spirit and of uh, truth and reconciliation, I also acknowledge my home is on the traditional lands of the Salic speaking people. Thank you. As I've mentioned before, I am not a politician and I've never taken a course in climate change. And my knowledge is that of the average guy. I'd never even heard of First Things First, but after reading your website, I, I thank you for the work that you guys do. I joined the Greens and this race because I believe we are in crisis, a climate crisis and a people crisis. When I ex accepted the invitation here, I expected to get an education. After reading your questions, I do hope you're not expecting me to know all the facts and figures and solve climate change in four years. I cannot. My answers will be simple and from my heart and all I can do is start and do my part. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schumacher. Uh, the next person to give the opening statement will be Mr. McIntyre. Hello, thank you. Uh, and uh, these are LED lights shining on my head. So uh, not... Uh... Uh, my co-working space on West Bank First Nation land is, uh, is busy today, so I haven't tried this room before. I am very excited to be part of this. Uh, you know what, the heat pump turned on right as I started talking. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be part of this debate. My very last uh, flight before the pandemic uh, was in late February to Juneau, Alaska, and I was speaking at the Innovation Summit up there. And... and um, there was a, a lot of presentations and, and talk about climate change. And when you're up in a place like Alaska, where you can actually see the real effects of uh, the changing climate on our, on our planet, it's really quite interesting. And, you know, uh, you know whether it's uh, changing migration patterns in fish, uh, you know, decisions that were made with building pipelines where they might have done ships before, uh, all kinds of things. Very, yeah, anyways, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Ashton, running for the Liberal Party. Thank you, sir. Uh, my compliments to Lori, Michael, Jim, uh, all the, my peer candidates, and to those online tonight. Thank you for uh, listening. I too would like to thank the original people of the Okanagan for sharing these incredible lands with us. Um, my name is Dan Ashton. Uh, I grew up uh, in the Valley. I came here when I was two weeks old. Um, most of my life, believe it or not, has been spent in the backcountry. Um, when I'm not uh, in public life, I find myself uh, in the solitude of the incredible vistas that we have here in the Okanagan Valley. Um, I would just like you to take a look uh, in the future, and tonight might not be the answer for everybody, but just take a look at a person's background. And I'd ask that you take a look at everybody's background. Because the people on the screen, I do recognize that we each and all have a concern for where we live and the climate and the issues that are facing not only our country and province, but the world today. So please uh, take this opportunity to do a little bit more in-depth study from each and every one of us. And I again would like to thank uh, First Things First for Okanagan for hosting this. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Ashton. And thank again all the candidates for being so concise. So now we'll move on to the first of the four questions that uh, we're, we're asking the candidates to address. And the first question has to do with weaning the economy off fossil fuels. And the background that uh, I want to share with you is that you know, current and previous BC governments have promoted the, develop the development of a liquid natural gas industry in the province, but largely on the basis that burning gas is less environmentally damaging than burning coal or oil. Um, but uh, if you look at the literature, the LNG industry itself is a significant greenhouse gas emitter. Um, and from my reading, about uh, almost one ton of CO2 is emitted uh, per ton of natural gas by the time it's uh, removed from the ground and transported. And uh, then again, more, more uh, CO2 when it's burned. Um, and this is at a time uh, when uh, the climate scientists are telling us that we really need to seriously think about leaving um, all the fossil fuels in the ground. Now, BC is blessed by having tremendous potential for renewable energy, um, geothermal, solar, wind, and uh, but the, apart from hydropower, these are hardly made use of in the province. So the question that I want the, the candidates to address is whether as an MLA, you would support redirecting the resources that are currently being used to establish the LNG industry in BC towards realizing BC's potential for wind, solar, and geothermal energy production. And the first person on my uh, random list to address that question is Mr. Schumacher of the Green Party for two minutes. I'm a pretty lucky guy. I've picked first quite a few times now. Um, the short answer, uh, I'm in the Green Party, so the short answer is yes, I will support the redirection of those resources. When I do not have the answers to such complex problems, I recognize I must go to the experts. As an MLA, I must sort out the experts representing LNG from those that are climate change experts and note where their interests lie. I too actually did believe that natural gas was a little the lesser of two evils. I did not recognize the link between the LNG and the Site C power. I do find it interesting that the LNG and uh, the NDP preaches climate change and yet gives almost a gazillion dollars to subsidize the fossil fuel industry. I also remember how the LNG ran on the platform to halt Site C and we know where that went. Just two days ago on BNN, there was interviewing a renewable energy expert. He claimed there was 55,000 jobs now in renewables in Canada and thousands more on the way. He said, the problem is that they're all little outfits, three to 30 people. So they don't have the clout that the lobby of the fuel industry does. He also pointed out that the fuel industry is not the place to invest for profits as it's a dying industry, but to invest in clean tech. When the big guys recognize that they can make money at clean tech, then the fossil fuels are really in trouble. What I don't want to see is the taxpayer be left holding the fossil fuels bag. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schumacher. 
So the second person on my list to, to address this question is uh, Mr. Ashton of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. You know, I, I am an advocate of uh, clean energy, but I'm also an advocate of the resources that we have in British Columbia. Uh, sir, one thing that you did mention in, in, in briefly is hydro. BC also has incredible potential in hydro. Um, the two wind forums behind us on the uh, Coquihalla Summit and on the name of the creek that will come in a minute, um, those were approved uh, during the RDUS days when I was the chair and uh, approved by the entire board because we know it is the right direction to go. But LNG is a transitionary fuel that I see. And it's not just what we do in British Columbia, it's what happens around the world. And if we can help get China and other East Asian countries off of coal burning with this transitory fuel, and therefore increasing the opportunities that BC has for the future because the gas will be sold at a profit for British Columbia. And that will help us in the future, whether it's social issues, environmental issues, or other human issues that are gonna be required funds in the future. I would really like to see um, everybody working together on this. And um, Ted brought up uh, um, about the NDP. The NDP were not supportive of LNG until they got uh, into power and, and realized in conjunction with the Green Party and realized there is a huge opportunity. And once again, I say not just for BC, but for a transitionary fuel um, that will hope change um, many of those in the world that are burning a lot dirtier fuels than coal and then, then, than LNG, i.e. burning coal. So I would really like to see it uh, um, put to use uh, um, and utilize those resources properly. And I'll give an example of, uh, of a country, Norway, and again, it was a fossil fuel, but they did put their money into a fund for the citizens, and that fund is now worth over $900 billion, which is $160,000 for every citizen, man, woman, and child in Norway. We have an opportunity, and I would like to see us utilize that opportunity in the future to make not only BC, Canada, and the world better. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so the next person on my list to address the question is Mr. McIntyre of the Libertarian Party. Hi, thank you. Yeah, we live in a very, very uh, <clears throat> large and complex world, and these these are are it, it's really hard to add up uh, where where things make the most sense. Uh, you know, wind. I see there's there's a lot of serious concerns with wind turbines fill, filling up landfills, and there's bird issues and bat issues and wildlife issues. So, um, I, I you know there's a lot more that we need to think about with that. And solar has you know potential issues as well with what you're. Um, having to do with batteries and, and these sorts of things. Geothermal is very interesting. I'm part Icelandic, as we learned in the other forum, and uh, that's a great place for geothermal. And I think that's something that we could look into here. But as far as the LNG, absolutely, we have the uh, opportunity that we can reduce um, uh, dependence on things like coal and oil in other countries. And the fact is, we're not going to overnight stop using these things. We're in a we're in a large world. Canada has what about 37 million people. Uh, out of eight, eight billion almost, um, you know, what we can do is uh, be innovative. And I have a ton of friends that work in the energy industry in Alberta. And, and if you could see what's going on inside some of these energy companies and the innovation that's happening, and they can do that because they have the engineering talent and they have the money. I've been uh, very intimately involved with Calgary Economic Development and the Life Sciences Innovation Hub in Calgary and, and seeing the diversification of the economy that's happening there. And uh, we can use the money from, uh, from that we generate from these resources to be innovative. What Canada has more than a lot of other countries have is a lot of really, really smart people that we can do some great things. And um, you know, I think we have a huge opportunity with, uh, with the liquid nat natural gas to make a positive effect on the world. And yeah, like someday, you know, it'd be great if we didn't need to rely on that for, for our energy, but right now we do. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. McIntyre. Uh, last person for this particular question will be Ms. Boot for the NDP. Thank you, Michael. Um, my short answer to question one is yes. But having said that, the coastal uh, gas link project is already underway. Uh, what the BC NDP have developed with their Clean BC plan with assistance from the former leader of the Green Party, Andrew Weaver, is a, a commitment to ensure that all future LNG projects are meeting the stringent limits that are part of that Clean BC plan. One principle I have followed consistently in my six years of local government work is to make sure that my decisions 
directly affect or positively affect the greatest number of people. And I'll give you an example of that. Case in point, my role in ensuring that the solar and battery storage project in Summerland is moving ahead. The same principle will be applied to my work as the Penticton MLA should I be elected. Well, I know that LNG is not the first choice for energy of uh, some people, the re reality is this, and we've heard this from some of the other candidates, we need to have transformational products that will help us during this transition. We're moving in the right direction in BC with the NDP, but it's just not going to happen overnight. Um, regarding uh, Site C, this is a project the NDP would not have started uh, if they had been in power when that was first proposed. There is an independent review going on and uh, John Horgan is waiting for the results of that. Our party's economic recovery plan points specifically to the opportunities in green technology, including renewable energy projects. And that means new jobs for British Columbians, jobs that work towards a sustainable and resilient future for all of us. Well, thank you, Ms. Boot. Okay, now we can have uh, one minute, either rebuttal or uh, elaboration on what you said, or if there's anything else you think you would like to add to this uh, brief conversation about uh, the LNG industry. Uh, so the first person uh, with one minute would be Mr. McIntyre. Um, sorry, I get one, one minute to discuss again this question. Or comment on what others have said or add anything in addition to oh, what you- Yeah, I, th I think, uh... Um, to, to say that the NDP would have gone, wouldn't have gone ahead with this project uh, if they had been in power is is completely uh, completely false and a little bit asinine. It, it 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 is a huge economic machine that's going on in our in our province, and it's very easy for a government. And this is the, again a systemic problem with uh, governments in general. Is like we wouldn't have done that if we weren't in power, and it and it and it, it it's, it depends whether you're in power or not. And in the end, they all end up kind of being the same with, uh, with too many, uh, too much bureaucracy. So yeah, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't agree that uh, the NDP wouldn't have gone ahead with this project or the Greens, to be honest. Okay. If I look down, okay, look down. Okay, yeah, thank you, Mr. McIntyre. The uh, next person who can, uh, has one minute to further comment or rebut is uh, Ms. Boot from the NDP. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to um, address what Keith has just said um, in, in saying that uh, the NDP uh, would not have, and what I, what I said was that the NDP, if given the choice, would not have started this project during the three and a half years that they were in power. We inherited a Site C that was well underway and we heard from the Christie Clark government that the reason they, were, they wanted to push it forward so that there was a point of no return in terms of the amount of money that had gone into the project. So although there was a review and it was taken forward to the BC Utilities Commission, that's the, that's the work that the BC NDP have had to carry forward. Like I said, there is an independent review being done right now and the BC NDP government will look at this again. Okay, thank you, Ms. Boot. Uh, next to uh, <clears throat> rebut or comment further will be Mr. Ashton for the Liberals. Uh, Michael, thank you very much. Uh, you know, with all due respect uh, to Tony, um, NDP have said that they, if I remember correctly, it's uh, 2035 that there will be no carbon uh, emitting vehicles on the road, electric utility only. And it's my understanding, and again, I've only read this, that we would need the capacity of up to three site C's to do that let alone the infrastructure to charge all those cars and all those vehicles. Uh, there's a unique opportunity uh, when you do build things, you do come across, unfortunately, some uh, unexpected um, issues. I think it can be worked through. And all I would say is take a look what hydro has done for this province and done for this country. Um, also, uh, uh, the NDP being opposed to run a river, which uh, in my way, uh, um, in my former critics role, was not well accepted by uh, the first people of the land. Um, especially when uh, they have the opportunity in their lands to uh, have run of the river, which will, which will um, uh, add additional power to the grid. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ashton. 
So last person to comment has been Mr. Schumacher. Um, just a short one that fa falls in with my premise that uh, a minority government works so well. Um, as I listened to each one of the uh, other candidates and I, I realized, you know, they actually have some really good points. And so as much as I'd like to be emperor and just rule the whole thing, uh, it really does make a difference. So if us four could, uh, could do it together, I think it'd be pretty cool. Okay, thank you all. Uh, and that completes our commentary on the first question. Uh, I'll move on to the second question, which has to do with protecting BC's unique terrestrial and coastal marine biodiversity. And as I'm sure you know, we're in the midst of a global extinction of unprecedented proportions. Uh, species are being lost uh, faster than almost any other time in history of the earth. This is largely a result of human alteration to the landscape and uh, other uh, human activities on the land and in the water. Uh, we're looking at a 60% decline in the number of vertebrates globally and over a million species are at risk of, ex species of plants and animals are at risk of extinction if we carry on the way we are. Uh, protected areas where natural ecosystems can flourish are uh, critical to the preservation of the remaining biodiversity. Uh, BC's done pretty well. To date, they have protected a little over 15% of the land base and a little over 3% of the marine area. However, Canada had committed to protecting 17% of the land and 10% of the marine area by 2020 and has clearly fallen short of that commitment. Nor has park funding been adequate to ensure that those parks can really serve their purpose in protecting biodiversity. And as we all know, human use of these protected areas has increased dramatically during the pandemic. Nevertheless, in its 2020 budget, uh, BC made further cuts to the budget for parks management. So my question to each of you is, uh, as an MLA, would you support a 50% increase in the budget for administration and protection of BC parks? So for two minutes, uh, beginning, uh, first speaker will be uh, Mr. Ashton. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I'm the only candidate, and I, I, I'm incredibly proud to say this, uh, on the screen today that helped create a Class A park in the Okanagan, the South Okanagan, Skaha Bluffs. The City of Penticton is the mayor and with an incredible council and a blessing of the regional district. Barry Penner, the Minister of Environment at the time, Bill Berezov, the MLA here, and John Skinner, the private landowner. We all collectively worked together and we were able to create Skull Hall Bluffs, or, uh, Skull Hall Bluffs, British Columbia Class A Park. Also, um, the National Park in the South. The Regional District was incredibly proactive when Senator Fitzpatrick brought it forward. I'm in full support of that as long as it's a willing seller and a willing buyer and also for the licenses of use there. Um, I would also say uh, in protection, take a look at what the Okanagan Falls sewer plant has done to remove effluent from those incredible salmon bearing stream, the Okanagan River and the uh, estuaries attached to that, that the ONA and the PIV and the Asoyus Indian Band are collaboratively working together to bring salmon back to the Okanagan waters. Yes, I'm in full support of additional financial support for BC parks for protection. I'm not so sure about administration, I always like to see the money going into the ground and it's going into the, those that uh, are there actually protecting the parklands and enhancing those parklands. So there's all kinds of opportunity, opportunity that we have if we do work together and really can make a big difference. But you know, when you take a look around what we have here in the South Okanagan, this part of British Columbia, um, um, we have to start doing something with the density that is taking place uh, um, in the lowlands. We have to do something to protect these waters and how we have to do it is again working together and that definitely includes the Penticton Indian Band and the Asoyus Indian Band here in the South Okanagan. Okay, thank you Mr. Ashton. Uh, the second person to speak to this question will be uh, Mr. McIntyre of the Libertarians. Hello, thank you. Wow, I got bad luck today. My phone's ringing now. Uh, no space, so. um, <clears throat> yeah, well, first, uh, I think I'll agree with Dan that uh, we, we definitely don't want to spend a whole bunch more money on administration. There's enough administration in the world. Uh, we, we actually uh, should decentralize the decisions on some of these things so that our individual re regions are making more decisions on this, not the federal government and not the provincial government. I have a few things about the question in itself. So we're asking about uh, BC 
BC parks and protecting our own areas. But uh, this is some some of the issue I have with some some of uh, uh, you know throwing stats around. All right, so we're talking about 60% decline in vertebrates globally and putting a million species at risk. So I would rather see you know how many species are we at risk in BC and what is our actual our our impact in the South Okanagan on the environment. And I think we're actually doing a, a bang up job here in the Okanagan. And uh, I, I want to address to uh, human use of protected areas. Um, so, you know, myself, I'm an avid trail runner, although uh, for some reason uh, this year, I just uh, wasn't doing it as much as I used to. And, and I, I know the vast amount of respect that people uh, who use our, our areas in, in and around BC have for it and I think you know yes we want to protect the species absolutely and we want to have biodiversity but we also have to remember that uh, being out in nature and enjoying these spaces uh, are important for our mental health especially in these times and uh, you know I think I, I think we really do a great job in BC already and I think yeah absolutely we want to protect protect our parts, um, but let's not uh, spend it on admin, let, on admin costs, let's, let's spend it on things that, uh, that actually matter and are, are, are important. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. McIntyre. Uh, the third speaker will be uh, Ms. Boot for the NDP. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the pandemic has exposed many silver linings and opportunities. One of these has been the ability for British Columbians to travel within the province and enjoy its many natural splendors that are protected in BC parks. That is why $8.1 million was added to the BC parks budget as part of our efforts to address increased use of BC parks during this pandemic time. So that was in 2020. I recently read that a report on the budget, uh, sorry, a report on the budget 2021 2021 consultation includes a recommendation to add $60 million to the BC parks budget in 2021 to counteract, among other things, the lack of investment in recreational infrastructure and services, staffing, and promotion over the last many years. I know that BC parks has experienced serious cuts to funding in the last two decades and that the money this year is not enough to make up for the lack of investment in our province's natural wealth. But the one point, or sorry, the $8.1 million is only a start. And while I'm not in a position to promise anything, I recognize the value in protecting and reinvesting in our BC parks. I would support an increase in the BC parks budget in a sustainable manner over multiple years. Okay, thank you, Ms. Boot. The uh, last speaker to this topic will be uh, Mr. Schumacher. Um, yeah, right. Well, once again, um, there's several th points that I actually agree with each of uh, the other candidates and working together, I'm sure we'd come up with something. And my short answer is yes, I would do my best to increase the budget for the BC Park uh, protection. I would also do my best to support the people who now shoulder the protection of wetlands and pristine areas like Ducks Unlimited, the Wetland Keepers, the BCWF, Wildlife Federation. They do so much towards sustainability of the wildlife. And I would support the small, small sportsmen's clubs who, who fight for habitat protection. Uh, an example, the small town of Summerland as a sportsman's club that actually donated $20,000 in one year to the mule deer study. That, uh, that is remarkable and it gives me hope. Um, another area that I would try to work on is that it, for, as far as wildlife, we, we only have three wildlife biologists from Kamloops to Cranbrook, and which is crazy. Then we wanna know what's going on and we don't have the experts to tell us. Uh, sorry, Dan, I have to disagree on the uh, national park thing in the south, but uh, I do wonder about the, the wisdom of that. There's already an LMPR plan in place waiting to be confirmed. Uh, it seems strange to put a national park in a place and then in the next breath announce, and we expect 235,000 people per year to visit it to help the local economy. I'm, I'm not sure how many uh, uh, toads and, and, uh, and animals will be left. I also recognize that at the same time, it's a very complex issue 
and I wish I had all the answers. Thank you. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you all. And then moving on to the rebuttal round, the next person, uh, or the first person to have a one minute rebuttal will be Mr. Ashton. Can you hear me Michael? now? Yep, I can. Thank you. And uh, it's good to hear that everybody's on side with this. This is an issue that uh, needs to be addressed and it needs to be enhanced. We all have to plan for the future and how we can preserve these incredible lands, these natural lands and the natural uh, flora and fauna that we have here in the Okanagan with the pressures that we're going to be facing. And it's going to be up to not only provincial government, municipal governments and regional governments to ensure that uh, um, uh, land use is put in place properly. And Ted, uh, um, I, I will say respectfully, the Snowy Mountain LRMP was in place. It had issues. Um, and when the National Park uh, was proposed uh, with the Senator, there was an awful lot of questions. And there still are an awful lot of questions about how, where, and everything, because the initial one literally went from the border to just south of Penticton. So over, over X amount of years and probably X amount of lifetimes, there is going to be an opportunity to protect those upper grasslands. And um, if that opportunity exists and continues to exist, it's something that I would like to see happen. Well, thank you, Mr. Ashton. Uh, the second person uh, for the one minute rebuttal is uh, Ms. Boo to the NDP. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm sorry that I, but I have to disagree with Keith uh, once again. Uh, I would suggest that uh, there is a very unique ecosystem and uh, climate here in the South Okanagan and that critical habitat is definitely being lost and resulting in more and more species at, at risk, not just animals, but um, habitat as well. That is why uh, in my time on the regional district, Okanagan Similkameen, I was very happy to support uh, the, South, the creation of the South Okanagan Conservation Plan, which is a, a way to put, put money uh, into for the areas that are, are um, uh, part of this plan to put monies into that plan and then leverage it to uh, work on some of these conservation things that like the uh, salmon coming back to the Okanagan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Boot. The uh, third speaker uh, for the one minute rebuttal will be Mr. Schumacher from the Green Party. So Dan, it's back and forth over the National Park. Um, uh, one of the issues I had, you know, there's, a, there's quite a vocal, I don't know, small or big group that, that doesn't want the park and, and uh, have found it incredibly frustrating that uh, when we talk about consultation and collaboration, that the feds will, uh, will call a meeting without any notice, then call another meeting and cancel it and uh, these guys that, that could have a, uh, a say are actually just shut out. So anyhow, as I said, it is a little more complex than it, than it first looks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Schumacher. And then last person to comment uh, for one minute, Mr. McIntyre of the Libertarian Party. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanna clarify, I wasn't saying that we don't have have issues with our, our ecosystem here. I had issue with uh, the question being a little bit fear-based by saying a million species. And, and, and what I think is that, and we can see it here, that we all know living here, um, what we need to do for our ecosystem and what we need to protect. So I think what we need to do is have more freedom and control and for, for us the ability to make some of these decisions ourselves. So myself personally, I've worked with uh, the Okanagan Invasive Species Society. I helped build the a software platform for them to re report invasive species across the three regions because it is such, so diverse between the central south and north Okanagan. Uh, I work with uh, with farmers in the Peace region where we've built weather weather websites for them so that we're, we're getting better data so that farmers are able to uh, to, to build uh, to grow their their crops better and to use better data so um, you know I think you know, there's a, there's a, there's a balance between uh, private enterprise and, and government that we can do some really great things. Thank you very much, Mr. Schumacher. Okay, now we'll move on to question three, which has to do with floods and wildfire. Uh, 
the most obvious uh, sh short-term effects of climate change in the Okanagan are increased frequency and intensity of both floods and wildfires. Uh, of course, we know that these things can be uh, moderated somewhat. Floods can be moderated through improvements to infrastructure, such as levees and drainage systems, through improved forest management, improved flood forecasting, and so on. And the impact of wildfire, uh, particularly in interface areas, can be moderated through improved forest management, such as thinning and removal of accumulated fuel, implementing fire safe principles, and existing residential development. And uh, certainly by restricting further residential development in very high risk areas. But of course, implementing these kinds of adaptations costs money uh, that local communities often don't have. And then remediating any losses from flood and wildfire also costs billions. So the question is, as an MLA, would you support significant additional funding uh, to local municipalities to implement improved flood protection, interface forest management, uh, and other actions to reduce risk from fire and flood. And for this question, the first uh, person for two minutes will be uh, Ms. Boot of the NDP. Thank you again, Michael. Forestry has been at the heart of British Columbia's economy for generations, families and communities depend on it. Forestry is also important for ecosystem health and biodiversity. Unfortunately, the approach to forestry over the last 16 years of, of BC Liberals rules was bad for workers and for the communities that were dependent on forests. They saw the loss of 30,000 forestry jobs and the permanent closure of dozens of mills. But just as importantly, and this perhaps is priceless, is the approach was equally bad for ecosystems and the diverse species that rely on those healthy ecosystems. I do think it's important that uh, local government get uh, the resources that they need to make sure that they're taking care of um, flood protection um, and, for, and forest management for the interface areas. But I also think it's uh, incumbent upon local government to make sure that they are adjusting their bylaws to make sure that people are no longer building in floodplains. A lot of work has been done by the Okanagan Basin Water Board uh, that was completed this year that shows where the floods are going to happen. And uh, that the same goes for interface areas. We need to stop building in the forests. Forestry, I feel, has a bright future, but it needs to be sustainably managed. And that means working with our Indigenous peoples and drawing on their wealth of traditional ecological knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boot. The next person to address this question for two minutes will be Mr. Ashton of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I was very fortunate about nine, 10 weeks ago to have the opportunity initiated by Minister Donaldson. And those are the, some of the opportunities you get when you show cooperation and collaboration and respect in the House. Um, the minister was able to arrange a meeting with uh, Sean Reimer and uh, senior staff, including uh, deputy ministers in various departments about controlling the freshet into our lake systems here in the Okanagan. It's not only the people on the lake that are affected by high water and quick runoffs with the freshet and the earlier runoff of the freshet, of the freshet uh, that is being caused by uh, um, open log blocks and uh, roads, etc. So. By doing that and by working together, um, the last three of the four years, by the way, uh, um, we haven't worked together. It hasn't been good over the last three or four years. And uh, Mr. Reimer and the ministry staff all concur that we have to do something, but we're all gonna have to work together on this. Um, when you start talking about interface and forestry, I was incredibly proud of working with the regional district and uh, the um, um, already through the US uh, for the first ever, the interface control for Naramata. And we need a lot more of it. Uh, Unfortunately, a lot of that was done by hand and it uh, um, needs to be mechanicalized. We have to protect the, uh, the forest, but we also have to protect the homes. And what we saw happened uh, at uh, um, the east side of Skull Hall Lake this summer, and unfortunately somebody lost their house in Heritage Hills um, because of interface issues. And we are going to have to work on this a lot harder. The, the climate is changing. Uh, people are going to continue to move into the Okanagan. There is going to have to be densification. 
but we are going to have to work together to ensure that uh, our water stays clean, our forests stay healthy, and people still have the opportunity of employment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ashton. Uh, the third person to address this question will be, be Mr. McIntyre of the Libertarian Party. Two minutes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I think uh, this is a good opportunity to kind of, uh, you know, uh, allay some of the misunderstandings of what the Libertarian Party is and, and what we want to do is work with all the different uh, the different stakeholders and, and, and we want to do what's best. And I think in a lot of ways, the bureaucracy in the province has caused a lot of damage in the uh, in the flood and fire situation. And, you know, in addition to writing pandemic simulators, I actually used to write uh, flood simulators and fire simulators as well for emergency preparedness. And, you know, I look back to the flood that happened in the Okanagan right there, and there was a uh, there was a bureaucratic problem there where one person was making the decision uh, of, about whether to open or close the channel. And the decision was made to protect the salmon when, when realistically in, in that situation, there was, uh, if we had enough data with the snowpacks and uh, enough open data that we could share it and, and we could all be part of the decision-making process, somebody might have flagged and said, hey, you know, something's looking a little bit different this year. And with the fires in particular and the logging, so one of our candidates in the Chocolate Lakes is a logger and, uh, you know, he sent me a text about this and, you know, there needs to be oversight and control of reforestation. Shady forest companies are going to take advantage of the system, but it's the bumbling bureaucracy that isn't really understanding the reality of the situation. So there's province-wide legislation on, legislation on restocking numbers for plantations. We're getting into this situation where we're we're getting these single crop trees up there we're spraying roundup on vast 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 amounts of land which is killing killing the fungal system it's killing things that, that uh, animals graze on and it's causing bigger and bigger problems and and again it's the province is thinking hey this is the way to to get the most value out of our uh, out of our logging crops but you know there needs to be some practicality in this and, and looking at things on a bigger uh, situation and again this is where again the government ends up being too slow to think and react and they make a decision in Victoria that applies across the province. Thank you Mr. McIntyre. Uh, last person to speak to this question for two minutes will be Mr. Schumacher of the Green Party. Thanks. Um, Yes, the simple answer again is yes, I'm green. I will fight for additional funding for the above. One of the reasons I put my name forward was after watching the YouTube video, Timber Mining the Headley Creek Watershed. I was shocked. Um, then I saw the same issue come up in the Peachland Town Council uh, headlines, when is enough enough? I then noted that with all the YouTube videos below them was Water, my watershed restoration projects. What this highlights is the desperate need to have forestry practices reviewed. And actually, so it was. The professional reliance review, all stakeholders were there, NDP in power for three years and has not acted on those recommendations. The Greens have a plethora of suggestions in this direction. Uh, one of them was to, instead of just having a head forester, to have a head biologist uh, to help balance out the true value of a forest is more than just a bunch of trees. Uh, we need to take control of our forests back from the major corporations. Our enemy is not the loggers, but the corporation he works for. The Greens are accused of being anti-logger when in fact we are actually pro-logger. We want there to be a forest for him and his children to work. It reminds me of the situation of the Sioux in 1860. The buffalo meat buyers, they paid the Sioux $1.75 an animal. The Sioux went out and slaughtered 30,000 buffalo one year. They had full employment. Five years later, they were starving. The buffalo were gone, just like our forests may be. I'd also like to see a provincial assessment of all our watersheds instead of the, as the logging company mentioned, uh, everybody wants us to go to the other guy's watershed to harvest. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that red flag. Sorry. Thanks a lot, Mr. Schumacher. Yeah. So we now move into the uh, rebuttal to this question. And the first person for one minute is uh, Ms. Boot of the NDP. Thank you, Michael. All right, one, one thing I'd like to start off my minute is uh, with is to 
say that there, there's a lot of agreement uh, from all four candidates on a number of things tonight, uh, which is great. Yes, absolutely. Thumbs up, Ted. Uh, but one thing I want to say is what sets me aside from my, uh, my colleagues here tonight is that I have dedicated my most of my life uh, personal life and work life and focused on sustainability. And uh, I, I think that's all I need to say. Good. Thank you very much, Ms. Boot. Uh, next person for one minute uh, to further comment on this issue is uh, Mr. McIntyre, the Libertarians. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think we, we all agree on a lot of these things and uh, political ideologies, to be honest, don't really uh, shouldn't play a part in the environment as much as they do. And, and again, I come back to, I, I think that uh, as we, we as humans have a, a better understanding, and I think a lot of people on this video probably are like, yeah, I got all, I have these ideas and, and, and ways to fix this, but the bureaucracy really gets in the way. And you know, you look at uh, interface fires, like absolutely, you look at the Fort McMurray fires and the Grand Prairie fires where they build up to these these old growth forests and and we've been putting the fires out and, and they're meant to go up. That's that's how they're designed. And uh, if you look at the Penticton fire that just happened, you know, we were all very, very scared that it was going to turn into something really, really bad. But the fact is that because it burned in the, uh, in the nineties, there wasn't enough fuel. So it didn't, it didn't turn, turn very bad. So we got to be very careful as humans, uh, what we're doing and how we're interacting with the environment. And we think that we're doing a good job. And I think with a lot of our forest management, uh, we've caused a lot more harm than, uh, than good. Hey, thank you very much, Mr. McIntyre. The uh, third person to comment uh, for one minute will be Mr. Schumacher of the Green Party. Well, so, sorry, I forgot to shut my mute on or turn it off. So uh, the only comment I have is how, um, uh, as far as Indigenous, that uh, the lessons that they managed the forests for a, a long time and we somehow missed. And apparently they, they actually would go out and light the fires every seven years so that they would have uh, renewed life in those particular areas. Uh, the point is just that there's, there's all kinds of places we can learn. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Schumacher. And uh, the last uh, person for one minute of to have further commentary would be Mr. Ashton of the Liberal Party. Thanks, Michael. And I was remiss in saying that, uh, yes, I will support additional funding uh, to uh, bring our forests back into line. Uh, Keith, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Deciduous spraying, especially up north, is causing a huge imbalance in the forests up there, not only to the trees, but also to wildlife. And uh, the loss of jobs uh, um, that um, Tony has uh, mentioned, a lot of it is due to mechanicalization. Yes, there have been losses of jobs. And we better work for, uh, with the First Nations um, because of uh, their inherent uh, knowledge, but also uh, uh, land ownership of the forest. And Tony, with the utmost of respect, the gentleman that, whose picture is beside yours and all your signs stood in merit and said, there will be no more mills closed under the NDP. Well, you asked the people in merit about that and closer, you asked the people in Kelowna about those words that were said. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on now to the final of question of the four, and it has to do with uh, the idea of a just and sustainable recovery from the social and economic shock of the pandemic. I think we're all uh, really concerned about the way the pandemic has affected our society and our economy, uh, but uh, the public health crisis has certainly highlighted some important inequalities in our economic system. Uh, and some of those uh, long predate the pandemic. So many uh, social commentators and progressive commentators are now uh, urging governments to adopt recovery plans that incorporate uh, six principles. First is to put people's health and well-being first. The second is to ensure a strong social safety net with relief going directly to the affected people. The third is to put worker and community needs before corporate and business needs. The fourth is to build social, economic, and environmental resilience to withstand future crises. The fifth is to build solidarity and equity across communities. And the sixth is to engage Indigenous peoples in the recovery and to respect their rights. So the question is, as an MLA, would you fight to include these six principles into any plan for BC's recovery from the pandemic? The first person I'll ask to address this for two minutes. Uh, but will be Mr. Ashton of the Liberal Party. 
Thanks, Michael. I just want to go through each one, put people's health and well-being at first. Well, if we don't have people's health and well-being, we won't have a nation, we won't have a country. Um, it's, it's imperative that we start taking a look at looking after those. And we have to start looking after those, not only with handouts, but with hand ups. Ensure a song stro uh, social safety net with ongoing relief to affected people. Again, we cannot continue to give handouts. We have to get people back into the workforce. We need to get people healthy. We need to get people directly affected and give them those hands up, whether it's through education, whether it's through opportunities, whatever, it has to be done. Put worker and community needs before corporate and business needs. Well, you better have, uh, you better have businesses, otherwise you're not gonna have workers. And this all has to be done together. You can't, in my opinion, you can't separate the, the, the two. We have to ensure that we work continually together to build those stronger, those stronger communities. And solidarity and equity, that's what Canada should stand for. We should have equality all through this country and we should have the solidarity of opportunity, um, not only in this province, but again, throughout the country. And engaging Indigenous peoples, I'm incredibly proud to have been the, um, the critic for Indigenous relations. Um, Tony described it as, I can't remember the exact word, Tony, but yeah, I was quiet on a lot of things because of my beliefs. And my beliefs are that I'm glad that UNDRIP has come through. It's long overdue. I hope Canada adopts it, and I hope other nations start taking a look at it. Because as has been said by all of us, there are huge opportunities to work with First Nations to make this country so much better for all. So I will leave it at that. And uh, again, I would like to thank each and every one of you for your comments tonight in regards to um, these issues, because we have touched base on many of these already. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ashton. Uh, the second person on my list to speak to this would be uh, Ms. Boot of the NDP. Thank you. So the question here is, as an MLA, would you fight to include the six principles above that you spoke to into any plan for BC's recovery for the pandemic? And I can say solidly yes. In fact, our BC economic recovery plan is all about people. After all, it's people that are the economy and it's critical that their health and well-being is a top priority in our province's recovery. The two health emergencies BC is experiencing has disproportionately affected vulnerable people. We must ensure that resources are being directed to the people that need them the most, such as rent relief, emergency recovery benefits, hiring new healthcare workers and other supports for hardworking British Columbians. Social justice for marginalized and racialized uh, communities is another area that we need to work on. It's, it's a, a social determinant of health, race is a social determinant of health as well as your, um, your income. The new hires, including early childhood educators, will be fairly compensated for the essential work that they do. An equitable, sustainable, and resilient future underlies the NDP's plan for economic recovery in our province. And that includes green technology, protecting community watersheds, and sustainably managing our forests. Thank you, Ms. Boot. Uh, the third person on my list to speak to this is uh, Mr. Schumacher of the Green Party. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, health and well-being, that's just a no-brainer and, and we all agree on that. So that's, that's an easy one. Social safety, safety network. Um, I believe in that, but I believe in, in a, a targeted way and in a sliding scale way. Uh, that's so we don't give people, that we give, actually I, I heard uh, Dan say, we give people a hand up. We do not teach them to be totally dependent on our handouts uh, with the result that uh, we end up with third generation welfare families. Uh, I don't wanna go there. Um, uh, as far as uh, giving money untargeted, a uh, thousand dollar bribe by the NDP to everyone under 125,000. I hardly know that many friends that make 125,000. So I'm not sure where they were going with that one. Um, if at least you're gonna bribe somebody, bribe the poor. Um, putting workers first, uh, also with balance. Uh, yes, we have to look after the workers, but if you have no hotel 
or, or no big business for jobs to go, that doesn't work either. So there, there needs to be a balance. Uh, future crises, this fits with my what's important and not urgent. Um, plan, plan, plan. And, and still stuff happens, but, but we do have to go there. A solidarity across the communities. I'm sorry, I didn't know what that meant. So uh, next, uh, engagement of indigenous people and respecting their rights, absolutely. And yes, I'll do this. And we must do this. We're neighbors, we have to learn to live together. It's all about relationships and, and we have lost them generally. Uh, PIB is just across the channel and yet I'm as guilty as many that I've rarely been there. I have next to no relationships there. That must change if, we must, if we're gonna survive. I spent a winter in South Africa and saw firsthand what happens when we do not learn this lesson? Thank you, Mr. Schumacher. Uh, last to take two minutes for this issue, Mr. McIntyre, the Libertarian. Yeah, I think uh, absolutely all of these things are a huge priority. And I think there's a big misunderstanding of uh, my views on how the government has handled this pan pandemic. I'm not saying that, the, that it's not real or that it's not important. What I'm saying is I think we, that we have not been strategic about what we are doing and we aren't putting people's health and well-being first. You know, when you when you see healthcare workers completely and utterly burnt out, um, I actually had a phone call from someone today and he said his uh, his mother is in hospice and she's dying from a bed sore. Um, you know, there's there are bad things happening. Uh, because of the way we're handling this pandemic. And I think we need to we need to look at this a little more strategically and look at it on the entire level of, of who are we harming and what are and what are we saving? Um, I, I think uh, you know the loss of business and the loss of purpose in life is uh, is is huge. And you know, and again, we've had very, very few cases in in pandem in Penticton. And you see today where you know one case at, at, at Safeway and people are, are losing their minds over it. My son works there and I know that that is not a risk to public health with that. So we need to be really cautious of the fear we're causing. We have to put um, ourselves first and we have to look at at how we're going to uh, get on the other side of this uh, strategically. We've gotten to reactive mode early in the spring and we haven't changed our model significantly in this constant everyday fear that we're getting of the numbers, the numbers, the numbers, the numbers, and we're not being taught what those numbers actually mean in comparison um, with, and you know, I'll touch on number six as well. I have the uh, great opportunity uh, with my space uh, in West Bank to uh, talk daily with uh, just one of the smartest uh, men I know who also happens to be an indigenous entrepreneur with, uh, you know, I'm very, very lucky with that. Um, and, and absolutely, we need to give uh, First Nations more independence in their lives. Okay, great, thanks. Well, uh, now we can go on to the rebuttal section, which is basically one minute each. And I guess I'll say, since we don't have a closing comment, you can use that one minute however you like. And the first person uh, on my list will be Mr. Schumacher of the Green Party. The one time I'm not prepared and I get to be first. <laughs> Come on, Michael. It's all uh, planned. It was all planned. Uh, I see. Yeah. Um, I, what I'm really pleased about being a part of this is that uh, how much we actually agree on. Uh, yeah, I throw a bit of mud over at the NDP and a little bit over at the Liberals. I can't. Uh, that's kind of part of the game. But man, uh, we're all trying to pull the sleigh the same direction, and I'm I'm really emotionally proud to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schumacher. Uh, Mr. McIntyre, you're next on my list. Yeah, I think we have a real opportunity this this election to kind of look at things a little bit differently. And you know, I know a lot of people think the libertarian platform is a little scary. It's actually not <laughs> in any way. You know, we don't want U.S. style healthcare. Nobody wants that. Uh, what I think what, that we really, really do need is is a more practical approach. And you look at you know here are four people with diverse uh, ideologies, and we're talking. Uh, I think the libertarian uh, uh, ideology is the only one that sort of balances out off on on all fronts. And it doesn't matter if you're left wing or right wing, as long as you don't want uh, authority being the ones and a top down approach. You want a more uh, reg uh, regionalized and more individual decisions. 
Um, and that, that, that's something that's severely lacking in our politics. And I think we really have an opportunity here to, to say uh, uh, to, the, to the government to the, and to the people of Canada that uh, we want somebody independent. All the thoughts and all, all this research I've done, nobody's, I've, these, are, these are my thoughts. Um, nobody's giving me talking points. I'm just very passionate about, uh, about British Columbia. Great. Well, thank you very much, Mr. McIntyre. Next on my list is uh, Mr. Ashton of the Liberal Party. Uh, Michael, thanks. Laurie, thank you. Jim, thank you. Uh, the people watching, thank you. And to the candidates, another enjoyable session. And these are very good. Um, I do concur, Ted, that uh, there's a lot more positive than there is negative here. And that just shows you work together. And uh, again, with all due respect to the current government, this is the wrong time to call the election. And uh, to, to Tina Lee that's in the background there, Tina, I got to see one of your tweets. And uh, I said the government was working good because it was working good because the, the Greens were there to hold their feet to the fire and the Liberals were there to challenge them on things. And when this, when this came around, this unfortunate pandemic came around, we all put our collective heads to go. I'll say it now, power corrupts, ultimate power corrupts ultimately. And that's what this election is about. And I'm sorry to be involved in it at this point in time for the reasons that the NDP are bringing it on. I think there's a unique opportunity, not only here in this forum, but for the ideas that we've all had to put it out to the general public and ensure that this country and province and this whole Okanagan goes in the right direction. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, Mr. Ashton. And I guess the last kick at the cat will be for you, Ms. Poot. Thank you. I, I, I will not be kicking at any cats, that's for sure. <laughs> but I appreciate your phrase. Uh, so thanks again to the, our organizers and those watching from their sofas at home. And of course, the candidates that are here uh, talking with me tonight. Because talking about sustainability and how we can take action on our changing climate collectively, what we can do collectively is my favorite topic. As we plan for recovery, we have a chance to elect a strong voice for the Penticton riding. We need a representative in a key role that is at the table in an NDP government. One that proposes and champions solutions for our unique region. One that is, has a history of fighting for sustainability. Now, I'm not sure why, and we've heard it several times tonight and also in the, a previous forum, I'm not sure why everyone thinks that um, we can't continue to work together. Uh, and I'm assuming that means that everyone thinks it's gonna be a majority government. Who really knows? None of us know that. But on October the 24th, I wanna take my place at the table and I'm asking for your vote to be part of John Horgan's team in Victoria. Uh, thank you, Ms. Boot, and thanks very much to all of the candidates. I really enjoyed your contribution to this uh, forum, and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens on the 24th. And again, also thank you to everyone who's uh, tuned in or will tune in to see this uh, discussion. I thought it was extremely interesting. So thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone. All. Thank you.